What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. It's not possible to be separated from something that you are. Who can separate us from the love of God? The devil? Demons? Principalities? We shared yesterday, whoever loves is born of God because God is love. My question is, if God is love, it's impossible to be separated from his love. What makes us more than conquerors is we focus on the inability to be separated from the divine that we are assured of in Christ. Today in the gospel, I want you to listen to something. We always talk about the kingdom of God on earth, and we, I always say, your kingdom come, your will be done in the Lord's prayer, and then we say at the end of a prayer, your kingdom on earth is in heaven. Jesus actually tells us what the kingdom looks like in today's gospel. He describes it for us. He describes it clearly. And I really believe that today you're going to have an awakening to another level that you've not had before. Because number one, we reverence God, but we're not afraid of him. The fear of God is not to be afraid of God, it's to honor him. It's not to be afraid of his judgment. It's not to be afraid of him. When I say him, I mean the divine. It's to reverence. And you see it in what the kingdom is like. A king loves his kingdom. He doesn't destroy his kingdom. He establishes it to grow it to make it strong and powerful and stable. So let's listen to the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew today. Another parable, everybody say it's a parable. I mean, it describes something that's not visible, but a reality. Put before the crowd saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which is a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. When it, when it has grown, say when it has grown, say it's got to grow. It is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make nests in the branches. When you look at a little seed, do you see a tree with a nest with birds? Or do you just see the seed? The kingdom of heaven is the ability to see the tree and the nest and the birds in the seed before it grows. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's the way we're supposed to preach to people. Because we see something in the seed of them that is not yet grown. And so when you have a kingdom perception, a seed is not a seed. A seed is the harvest that's in the seed. Are you with me? That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. He told them another parable. Say, here comes another one. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven or yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was leavened. She mixed it in. And once you mix it, you can't unmix it. So the kingdom of heaven is that whatever God has mixed, he's not going to unmix. Because nothing can separate us. So the kingdom of heaven is an assured mixture that cannot be unmixed. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And the kingdom is also like a treasure hidden. Say a hidden treasure. A treasure I've not yet seen. I don't know what it is. It's hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has, not to buy the treasure, but he buys the whole field. Hello, Jesus. He saw the treasure of our salvation, and so he bought all of creation and all of humanity. He died once for all. He bought the whole field to get the treasure of sons. (laughs) That's what the kingdom is like. It's like someone who says, I want the treasure, so I'll buy the whole field. I want salvation, so I'll save everybody. I'll die for everybody. That's what the kingdom is. It's not selective. 
It's not performance. It's love. He sells all that he has. He, God did not withhold his only begotten son because he wanted to buy the whole field, not just the, the treasure in the field that he liked. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. One, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all he had and bought it. Didn't hold back. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom is a place where you never hold back to vulnerability, transparency, and investment. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net. Everybody say a net. Which was thrown to the sea and drug out fish of every kind. Not just the ones I like to eat. Not just the ones that are clean. All of them come. Say all of them are drug in. When it was full, men drew ashore and sat down and sorted the good into the vessels, but threw the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. He drags the good and bad together. The weeds, the wheat. <laughs> That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That God is hidden in all of it. There's no place. See, if there's some place God's not, then God's not. Now, if there's some place God, someplace God cannot be, then God cannot be. Because he is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Happy are those who hear these words, believe them, and obey them. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on me. Father, do a quick and sharp and excellent work in us this morning. Allow the words I speak today to address the issues we're struggling with. Father, help us to intentionally focus on our own development that we may deal with our inner violence so we can end external violence. That we may deal with inner peace so we can establish external peace. And Father, I pray today that we'll have ears to hear and hearts to believe and courage to manifest your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The title of my message today is, What You See is Not Always What You Get. Now I know there's a meme out there, Deacon Todd told me there's this meme called WYSIWYG. Does anybody know about the WYSIWYG? What you see is what you get. That's WYSIWYG mindset. And a lot of people like to say that about themselves when they're rude and they're insensitive. Well, what you see is what you get, man. It's the way it is. But in the kingdom, what you see is not always what you get. Because the kingdom is different than the world system. What you see is not what you always get. So the lectionary Old Testament reading today unveils something for us. We didn't read the Old Testament today. We, we sometimes include it, but we've not read it. But it goes along with the gospel that I read. So I'm going to read it to you. Some of you may have never heard this story before. It's a story of Laban and Jacob. And Jacob falling in love with Laban's youngest daughter named Rachel. And uh, Jacob, Jacob had, wanted this woman, man. This is my wife. This is my bride. I'll do anything for her to be my bride. So in Genesis 19, we hear this story, and I'll update you on it a little bit. But here's an issue where this Rachel was one babe. Let me tell you, she was a hottie. She was good looking, man. I mean, I'm telling you, she was the eye of the town. 
And this is the one, at least for Jacob, you know, uh, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But this is the one I want. And when you want that wife, everybody else goes down the totem pole. You got to decide. I'm willing to do what I have to do to get my bride from her daddy. No amens up in here today. I guess we're too postmodern. We think everything's about how I feel and all this stuff. But this is a, like the kingdom. This is like what I'm talking about here. So Laban said to Jacob, Laban said, okay, you like this girl. Okay, that's fine. Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? In other words, it's going to cost you to have her. Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. Everybody say, Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. Seven years. I'm going to labor for you for seven years. That's a long engagement. We're talking about a long engagement here. I mean, by the end of seven years, man, you better love this person, right? So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. See, when you love somebody, time flies. Love causes time to fly. When you get depressed and slow down, it's because love isn't flowing. I'm going to preach here for a minute. Some of you like the story so far. Then, see, when I do premarital counseling, I tell everybody, let me tell you something, this is a long haul here. You can't ride on the waves of chemistry and emotion. You better be ready for the long run here. You know what I'm saying? Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her. In other words, we want to get a little busy here. For my time is completed. He said, I've waited this long. Call, uh, we're going to take care of business. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. Now you have to understand, in those days, the bride was completely covered. The bride was completely covered in garments. The head, other than a place to look through, the whole body, it was just this white, white walking mass of cloth and so my man um is waiting for his bride rachel but jacob brought her leah him leah and he went into her hmm. laban gave his maid zippa to his daughter and leah to be her maid when morning came it was leah Come on, guys. Now, you all ought to be, you ought to be saying, whoa, now. See, because back then, the familiarity physically was not available. There was a distance. Anyway, that's a story for another day. What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? He says, I was working for Rachel and you gave me Leah. Now, there's different versions of this story. Some people say, the, the scripture says she had beautiful eyes. So that's how the whole thing got pulled off, was with the eye gate. Are you? This is, a, this is interesting. And so, it was like, he wasn't familiar with her body shape and all of this stuff. Because in that time in Israel, they, they didn't show off there. You know, they walk around in hot pants and speedos and stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty concealed. I've heard the story said, well, she had beautiful eyes, but this woman was ugly. I mean, I, I, I mean, compared, at least compared to Rachel, she was not beautiful. And so he wakes up, and it was Leah. Maybe that's an embellishment, I don't know. 
He said, why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, because of this reason right here. This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. He said, you asked for the younger. But in our country, that can't happen. Because there's a different order. There's an order that transcends your desire. There's an order that transcends your appetite. This is what the kingdom is. <laughs> this is what the kingdom is like. Well, y'all looking at me funny this morning. Complete the week of this one. He's called it a week, which is seven years. He says, complete another seven years, and we will give you, notice, we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Took him 14 years to get what he thought he'd get in seven. In seven, he gets... He chooses Rachel, but he gets Leah. Has that ever happened to you? You choose one thing and get another? Think you're get, That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. On earth, that's what the kingdom of God is like. What you see is not always what you get. Okay. We prefer the stability, order, and predictability and control that a what-you-see-is-what-you-get kind of world offers. It makes life easier and more manageable, or at least that's what we hope and want to believe. We like the WYSIWYG world, but it's time to reject the WYSIWYG world and move into the kingdom. The problem is that life doesn't always work that way. What you see is what you get. Nor is that how... Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes real life, kingdom life, is like a net dragged through the sea. It pulls both the good and the bad. Other times like a field that you see day after day. Deep within the ordinary dirt, within the thing that never changes, is a treasure hidden waiting to be discovered. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed small. Sometimes the kingdom is like yeast that is blended into flour and mixed until it is leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field worth buying the whole field. Or a merchant who finds a pearl and sells everything for it. Then the scripture says, Therefore every scribe trained in the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household that brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. That is what our movement is about. It's about ancient apostolic tradition and generational relevance. That's why we're a convergent church. That's why we practice liturgy in the Orthodox tradition, but we also embrace the modernity of our generation. Is that we must, if we're going to be kingdom, we got to bring out of, our, out of our treasure both the order of the old and the relevance of the new. For every scribe trained in the kingdom of heaven is likened unto that. Turn to somebody and say, Amen. Now I get it. Some of us just like the new. Some of us just like the hand clapping, preaching, shouting, dancing, flag waving, smoke machine, shaking, baking, dancing kingdom. But there's also this old that has to be mixed in with the leaven of the new because every scribe trained in the kingdom brings out both old and new. Turn to somebody and say, we like the old and we like the new. And without both of them, you don't get the fullness. You get the fullness like bringing them both out, right? Most of us have lived long enough to know that despite our desires and hopes, our planning and our hard work, we do not always get what we want. The good and the bad, the dirt and the treasure are not far from each other. I did everything right and I got this. I gave it my best effort and it ends up like this. I believe for this, and I didn't get that. Are you following me? No, no, nothing is as it seems in the kingdom. What you see is not always what you get. 
Look what happened to Jacob. He chose Rachel and woke up with Leah. Whoa. I suspect that happens to all of us. Haven't you been there in your lifetime when you chose and worked for one thing but got another? Haven't you been there? Times in your life seemingly changed overnight. Your life just changed overnight. Something happened you didn't expect and it changed everything. Some was in your control, some was not in your control, and some was both. Your life was one thing and now it's another and you didn't choose it or want it. That's when we have to make a decision about our faith and how or even whether we will move forward. When I counsel people, when I disciple people, I tell them, you're on fire now, but let's talk in a year. When the newness wears off, the newness of I'm washed, I'm cleansed, I'm growing, when the newness wears off and life starts calling you back into the world, and let's see where your commitment is then. That's how, what happens in marriages. That's why marriages break up so quickly. Because they never read the third chapter of Gary Thomas's book, Sacred Marriage, that says marriage is for one reason, and that's to please God. That's the only reason you get married, is to please God. You don't get it to cure loneliness. You don't get it to fix your sex appetite. You don't get it to make your family happy. You get it for one reason, to please God. Why did you get married? We did it to please God, to show that we can represent God and his bride in the earth. If you got married for any other reason than to please God, that marriage is at risk. We know that that got changed in the Enlightenment movement. When the, when the intellectuals started taking over and started creating all these condemning rules and regulations about salvation. When St. Augustine taught about marriage, he said, it is to reveal God's love for his people. It is not to fulfill loneliness or sexual desire. It is to please God. And that's the marriage God has with his church. Oh boy. The reason we come to God is to please God, not to get our problems fixed. The reason we come to God is to please God, not to fix our problem. Oh, I'm running out of time here. Huh? That's when we have to make a decision about our faith or even whether we will move forward in our growth in our faith. Do we trust there is more happening in life than what we can see and understand? Can we look at the mustard seed and see the birds in the nest? Will we preserve in searching the market, persevere in searching the marketplace for the pearl to be found? Or is our faith limited to what we see? Is our faith limited to what we see? And I'll say, is our faith limited to what we feel here and now? What can be verified by facts? Is that what our faith is limited to? What is logical? Is that what our faith is limited to? Are we woodsy wiggers? To what fits our desires? Is that what we stick with? Our expectations? Is what we see now all there is and ever will be? Is this as good as it gets? Most of us probably prefer what you see is what you get kind of world. If we ask the question, we want to be able to trust what we will get, an honest answer. We all want an honest answer. We want a fair wage for a day's work. Are you here this morning? We want to know that if we do the right thing, we will get the result we expect and deserve. We don't want a surprise or hidden agendas from anybody. We prefer the stability, the order, the predictability, and the control that a what you see is what you get kind of world offers. It makes life easier and more manageable. Sometimes, though, things are not as they seem. Who would rather, who would have ever thought that the soap opera stories of the dysfunctional families in the Bible, of their brokenness, of their lies and deceptions, of their betrayals, of their schemes and unmet expectations, of their unmet hopes, would become our sacred stories. Those are our sacred stories. Dysfunction is our sacred stories. 
Does anybody here live in a dysfunctional family? If you don't think you do, let me come and visit for a week. And I'll help you discover some dysfunction right up in there somewhere. Every one of us has dysfunction in our family because that's our sacred story. And that's why we have to embrace the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> we each have stories of dysfunctional families and relationships, sorrows, loss, despair, brokenness, stories of betrayal, lies, and schemes. Stories about how we did not get what we expected. Stories of how things did not work out for us like we thought they would. Sometimes through our own fault and other times simply by chance or the circumstances of life. Those stories are probably not the first place we turn to when we are looking for God. We don't look for God when we chose Rachel and wake up with Leah. We look to blame. How could you do this to me, Laban? Because I would have to break the order of the kingdom to do it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his bride. You've got to buy the whole field, baby. You've got to build your own life, baby. And that's what Jesus did when he came. He established the kingdom here. That transcends the secular world. Even when we chose Rachel and we get Leah, the yeast of God's life, the yeast of God's love, the yeast of God's presence, the yeast of God's healing is working within us to transform and make new our lives. Even when it looks bad, God is blending the yeast into the flour so that it will rise and nourish us. Maybe you're in a situation today where you just need to declare, God, you are good <laughs> all the time. And I want you to know that I believe in every one of our lives, the yeast of God's love is being blended into the flower of our carnal lives so that we can be nourished with a new life and a fresh start in Christ every day. Stand to your feet with me this, e this morning. The leavening power of God. Everybody say the leavening power. Do you know what I mean by the leavening power? The expanding power, the growing power of God within us can do more than we can ask or imagine. Bow your heads as we pray this morning. What we see is not all we get. Lord, you have so much more for us than we can comprehend or think. I has not seen, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the things you have prepared for those you love. You have a destiny for us that's just a seed right now, but within it is a great harvest. You have a plan for us that we may be stuck in a seven-year process with Aaliyah, so that we can embrace our Rachel at the appointed time. Lord, I pray for everyone right now in this place that we would awaken the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That we'd have the courage to buy the field to get the pearls, to plant the seed to get the harvest, to drag the net to get the meal that we would embrace your will on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God. We believe in one God.